Oh, hey guys, good, mo good afternoon and welcome to Digital Classroom. I think we are live now, so let's start the trailer. And later on you hear why people are laughing here behind me, so yeah. Yeah, so now we are live. So I already did half digital classroom thinking we were live, but there's this little button up in the corner of YouTube live. And that little button says go live. It's a big blue button. Frank. It's a small button when you look from a long distance and anyway, it's not big. <laughs> Yes, he's next to me anyway. So YouTube has this new system where uh, normally we did everything. Uh, let me just show you. That's easier. So normally we did everything from Wirecast, which is running over here. And then as soon as I press go live on Wirecast, actually YouTube starts a live broadcast, right? And that's when all you guys got the notice from, hey, Frank is live. Now, they changed something in the whole setup for live streaming, and now you have to do two things. So I have to go live in Wirecast, and I have to go live on YouTube. And that's why my phone is probably going out, <laughs> that everybody goes like, yeah, now you're live. So sorry, we are a little bit late. Hey, welcome to Digital Classroom. What is Digital Classroom? Digital Classroom is a live broadcast straight from our studio in the Netherlands. And it started, I think, eight or nine years ago when we started with a small webcam, which I carried around in the studio. And we started early in the morning, even with the makeup of the model and whatnot more. It was boring as can be, but people kept watching. And why is that? Because you have interaction with the photographer. You see everything the photographer does. So many videos are edited where you see a lighting setup and immediately, boom, like magic, the lighting setup is there. And you go like, what, how, why? And it isn't explained, right? And people get confused by that. And by seeing a whole live stream and seeing everything set up, that's mesmerizing and that's magical because at that point, you literally get everything in. Also, if something goes wrong, if something falls down or if something doesn't work right out. So going from a small webcam to this is, of course, a totally different setup because now we are using four cameras, we are using Wirecast, we have proper audio, and of course, the streaming is a lot better. So anyway, Digital Classroom, special episode today. I don't know what we're going to do. I have a slight idea what we're going to do, but it's always going to be different. And we have a great model for today, and that's actually Nadine. So Nadine, say hi. There we have Nadine. And this is the 50th episode, 5-0, the big one, the, the whatever one, but it's 50, and that's a lot. So I'm not tired yet, maybe at the end of the 50th, I don't know. It's... You know why? Because that's the interaction with you guys. Because you guys ask me questions, that's why every digital classroom is unique and different. So keep doing that, please. And also send in your images, of course. Today we're going to talk about two different lighting setups. One is with speed lights, small strobes, and one is actually with our big studio strobes. And today there's also something else. And that's really cool, because normally in the studio we only, of course, have N a week. And maybe an intern. So there we have our, where's my intern? There's Nadine, where's my intern? Oh, there, there's my intern. And we have guests, we have Daisy Ray and... Fred and Ineke. Fred and Ineke, yes. I never put Daisy Ray on the spot because she doesn't know me yet. Well, now she knows me because we already did this when we weren't live, but I'm not going to say that I already did. But anyway, so, hello, how are you guys feeling? Yeah, congratulations on the 50th, and that's when I lose my memory because we thought we were live and we weren't. So anyway, so anyway, today, Nadine, and we're going to do the speed lights first. Now, when you are celebrating something, of course, you need something, right? And what is that something? That something is a cake. Now, don't worry, we're not going to eat the cake. We're going to shoot the cake. <laughs> it's even more funnier, right? So what do you do when you have a cake? Well, you, of course, have a candle. But how do you light a candle? How, how do you do that stuff? So in this setup, we're actually going to go through different solutions of shooting that. We're going to do the normal natural light setup. I'm going to combine it with strobes. And of course, we're going to explain the dragging the shutter. And I'm going to show you the retouching process. So that's cool. After that, we take a little break. And then we're going to do the second set. Now, with the second set, 
I don't exactly know what's going to happen. I see the setup and that was actually my choice, but what we're going to do after that, it's still a little bit of a surprise. So we'll see, at least for you guys, it's a surprise. But trust me, wait till the end. I think it's going to be fun. And a week set it up, so probably I, I will get hit in the head or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, so in a week, are you ready to take over from me? Yes. Okay, so I will walk over there and then, um, yeah. Oh, but before we go, one more thing. You know, um, Digital Classroom started out, I think, five years ago. This is season five. And right from the start, there were two companies who totally believed in us and what we were doing. And that's Rogue Expo Imaging. Thank you so very much, guys. Eric and John, you are amazing. And, of course, BenQ. And BenQ, of course, creates amazing monitors. We have the newest one here with a real paper technique, and it's absolutely stunning. And of course, Rogue Expo Imaging, you all know from the Flash Benders. They even have a Flash Bender with my name on it, so that's an awesome product, right? And the cool thing about both companies is that they really listen to photographers. Now, there are many companies out there that want to support your work or that want to do something with you. And most of the times, believe it or not, I actually decline. Everything that I use is actually products that I stand behind. And sometimes that means that I actually can get something from a manufacturer X but I'm actually buying it from manufacturer I for the very simple reason, I like product I better. In the end, of course, it will all work out, I hope, but yeah, that's the way that I work. So having BenQ and Rogue as main sponsors for over 50 episodes is just absolutely amazing. And guys, try to support those companies because they listen to photographers and they create amazing products. So let's start out with small strobes, Nadine, a cake and fire. Where's the ego? Fire. 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 Fire a fire. Okay, let's go. Let's switch over to uh, the Nadine cam. Uh, and we do also have a camera on me because I don't see that camera. Or is that yeah. that one? Oh, okay. Cool. Nice one. Okay, nice. Okay, let me walk here. Okay, so first setup. Now I have an intern behind the camera, so she does something. Normally we have a fixed setup. Okay, first setup. What I'm going to use is I'm going to use a Nissin strobe here. And we have a Frank Doro flash bender with a strip light attachment. Now the cool thing about the strip light attachment is that it also has a grid. So when I turn this around, you can actually see that there's an egg grate over there. Now let me first just start out by showing you what it does, how it looks. So... On the monitor, you will see the images coming in from Capture One. And over here, it's just very simple. We're going to turn on the strobe. And I'm going to make a very, very simple light setup. So it's not something spectacular. We're just going to try something. Now, I like to light my models from really close. Let's put this a little bit higher. And one of the things that a lot of people ask me, like, what kind of... Yeah, what kind of stand do you use? And my advice is always when you work with speed lights, get a boom stand. The boom stand has an arm, and that means that you can literally just place your strobe any angle you want, and that gives you a, a tremendous flexibility. So let me just grab the camera very quickly. And the first thing, of course, with speed lights is there are several ways of shooting a speed light. Now, one, of course, is manual. Manual scares a lot of people because you have to set up everything. It's way easier to use another technique called ETTL. Now, ETTL is metering through the lens, and it's now set up for ETTL. Let's see what happens. So Nadine has beautiful, beautiful styling. You don't want to mess that up. And of course, any week, do you have a card for me? Because this is one of those days. Yes. Since our latest firmware update, I can't shoot without a card in the camera anymore. Which is weird. But hey, we don't mind. Okay, try it again. There we go. Okay, so first setup is very, very simple. Light from the side. You get a little bit of an accent on your model as soon as the images come in. Oh my. One of those days. Oh, it, there we go. Okay, so as you can see with ETTL, there's a slight overexposure in the image. Now, 
how, how does that happen? ETTL always calculates to 18% gray. Now, 18% gray is middle gray. And that means that in an image like this, where there's a little bit of white, but a lot of dark areas, it will actually tend to overexpose just a little bit. It's not a real problem. This is channel C. So let's go down, let's say minus 0.7. Let's do the same thing again. And now the image will come in a little bit faster. So now you can see that by underexposing just slightly, it's already looking a little bit better. I also zoomed out a little bit, so you have a little bit more of that black in. Okay, let's first try to get a nice pose. Nadine, can you yes, there we go. That's awesome. Okay, I'm shooting at 2.8 manual mode, and the strobe is on ETTL. Now, this freaks some people out. Like, how can you shoot ETTL on manual? That's the whole trick. The camera is on manual, 125th of a second, f2.8, ISO 100. The strobe is on ETTL, and that combination is perfectly possible. The only thing that doesn't work on some cameras is on some cameras, when you're in manual mode, you can't really use exposure compensation for your strobes if the strobe is on manual mode. If the strobe is on the normal ETTL mode, you can still use flash exposure compensation. And that's what you see in doing me now. So let's go down even more, just to show you how it works. So now at minus two, and you will see that the image gets way too dark. But in this case, it also gives a little bit of a mood. So by using ETTL and exposure compensation, you have a latitude of, let's say, four stops. Two up, two down, in which you can correct. But in all honesty, and everything before but is not really relative. It doesn't look professional if you do it like this, right? Because it took me about four shots before I nailed my exposure. So normally I'm a big, big fan of putting the strobe on full manual power. And now use a light meter and meter the light. But for this setup, we're not going to do it because I want to show you something else. And a week, you had a special occasion, yeah. a cake. So let's grab the cake. It's still in storage, I believe. And of course, we have a candle on the cake. So what do we do with the candle? Well, of course, we have to light the candle. Oh, that looks yummy. Let's take a little break. <laughs> no, this is life. We can't take a break. OK, so first things first. We already set up the light correctly. So let's just turn off for now my remote control. So I'm just going to take it off for a second. Uh, let's just turn it off. I think that's easier. Okay. And give her the cake. Without lighting it yet. Don't drop it when it's lit. <laughs> she just drops a matchstick. Matchstick, right? Okay. So when I don't use any form of lighting, what I do is I switch my camera to AV mode. Aperture priority. The thing is, my lens can't go lower than 2.8. And when I look at the lighting now... When I shoot on 2.8, yeah, that's not going to fly because now my exposure is way off. It takes way too long. And in all honesty, this doesn't work at all. So what do I have to do? Well, I have to get that shutter speed up, right? So there's a setting on almost every camera and it's called auto ISO. Now, some people say it's only for beginners, but auto ISO is absolutely awesome because the camera actually determines the ISO it needs. So I'm going to go to auto ISO. And now on most cameras, you will have an option, and I've programmed that under the C1 button, where you can set your minimum shutter speed. This means that as soon as it hits that minimum shutter speed, from there on, it will push the ISO up. So I set the minimum shutter speed on 1 30th of a second. I know I can handheld that pretty easily. And at that point, as soon as it hits that 1 30th of a second and it goes lower, then it will raise the ISO so you can shoot on 1 30th of a second. This means that you can never ever be surprised by very, very long shutter speeds. Now, some people will go like, yeah, but Frank, isn't there a little bit more noise? Yes, but you can choose an image that you can't use because it's blurry or an image you can use with a lot of noise. Choose. I will choose the noise for the very simple reason you have the image. Okay, so let's see what ISO I have now with the studio lighting on. ISO 1250, 130 of a second. 
Looks pretty okay, looks pretty good. The only problem is I don't like the atmosphere of the shot. So for this image, what we're gonna do, believe it or not, we're gonna turn off the studio lighting. So you guys are gonna see me in the dark, or not. Probably better. There we go. So now it's really, really dark. And what we're gonna do now is I'm actually gonna shoot it on 2.8 auto ISO. And thanks to the amazing Sony, I can just autofocus without any problem. There we go. Now, when you see the images coming in, in all honesty, I don't like the images at all. They, they take away all the atmosphere in the shot. I want them darker. Now, remember that flash exposure compensation you had? There's also something called exposure compensation. So let's try that now. And that's on the top of the camera. Go to minus three and let's see what happens. Okay. By going to minus three, you see exactly the same that you saw with flash exposure compensation. The image gets darker. Okay. Now, you know why I did this, right? Because now when we light the candle, you're going to see that this works. But wait a minute. Let's back up and let's say that we don't know that trick. So I'm going to keep it on zero. So everything I just explained, forget about it. But just keep it in the back of your mind. Okay, Larissa, can you please, without lighting my studio, light on the candle? Interns, you have to be careful with them. There goes my luster light backdrop if you make it. Awesome. Is it an exploding candle? No? Okay. No fun. Okay. Okay, let's try this. I remember that technique. Let's see if we even need it. Oh, this is weird. Hmm. Look at this. Without using exposure compensation, without using anything, I have a great image. What, what the heck's going on? Well, this is sometimes when you have knowledge of lighting, don't think too far ahead. When you use exposure compensation, it's always available light into the mix. So that means if there's no available light, it will try to light your model completely flat. So what a lot of people do is when they use candles, they will immediately do this. Oh, yeah, otherwise it's too light. Let's go to minus three and get that really nice candlelight look. So then they do something in an image like this. And then you get a little bit of that mood, but you're underexposing a lot because this is the mood that you want. But isn't it way smarter to just use your camera on exposure compensation zero. So let the camera do all the stuff. Stuff, sorry. Look at your image, and if nothing is blowing out, you can always in Photoshop just get in more of that shadow back. So a lighter image, you can always make a little bit darker. Remember in the past when they called it exposed to the right? Nowadays, that isn't really necessary anymore, but still with images like this, if you don't blow out anything, just keep it on zero and just build it to Hero in Photoshop. Okay, let's try a few like this. Nice Nadine, can you look with your eyes towards me? Really nice. That's cool. Low yes, that's nice. Love it. Really cool. Always coach your mother. Tell her she's doing fine even if she isn't. Nadine, of course, is always doing fine. Awesome. Okay, but now let's say that we like these shots, but sometimes we think it's a little bit too harsh. It's, uh, I absolutely love that one, by the way. But let's say that we want a little bit more. Now, I like it when she looks away from the light, but I would love to have a little bit of a side light. Now, there's one thing that you have to realize. And let me turn on the uh, light very quickly so I can explain something to you guys. Are you having fun? It's like holding a steak in front of somebody. Don't eat it. It's don't. Anyway, so if you work with lighting, every single light source has a color temperature. Now, Kelvin determined the color temperatures in degrees, starting very low reddish, 2800 degrees Kelvin, all the way up to blue, which is about 9200 degrees Kelvin. When you calibrate your monitor, you probably heard the term 6500 degrees Kelvin. That's like the middle ground. When you use strobes, you actually see a lot 5,000 degrees, 5,500 degrees Kelvin. That's often where your strobes are. Candlelight is way lower, like way lower, almost like maybe 2,000, 1,500 degrees. It's very reddish. 
When you combine that with a strobe that's very blue, because it's higher in temperature, you have two different color temperatures in one image. If you want to correct that, there are certain gels for this. They, those are called CTO gels, color correction gels. You also have special effect gels like red, green, blue, cyan, magenta. But for correction, we call them CTO gels. Now, in this case, do you think I'm going to use correction gel? It's like a puppet, like Sesame Street. You shout no. no, no, no. Okay, awesome. So we, we have an audience here, so I also want to use my audience. Thank you very much. So how is the audio, Annabeek? Is the audio okay? I think so. Okay, I hope so. Let me try something. I think this will be better. Okay, so when I know that my lighting from the back, or my strobe, is a different color temperature, I can of course play with this. Because now I can actually use, like for, an, for example, an accent light that's a little bit blue. So let's ask the model to step forward. And let's take this strobe, put it behind my model, and let's use it a little bit feathered. So I'm actually shooting away from my model and let my model look that way. Oh, let me turn off the lighting again. And let's see what it does. So at first, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to use it as it is. So I'm going to turn on my... And then hold the candle on that side if you want. Perfect. So I'm not going to do anything. Oh, and immediately you will see a big problem. There's way too much light from that strobe. It's ridiculous, that's way too much. Okay, so let's go down. Okay, two stops down. Oh my. Even with two stops down, it's way too much light on that side. So we don't want that, right? What do we do? Well, luckily, all strobes also have manual mode. So let's go to C. Let's go to manual mode. Okay, and let's go to the lowest setting possible. And I can already tell you, probably, it's way too much. Because I can't go any lower. Now, what is going on? And this is something that you will see a lot during, for example, weddings, photo shoots with speed lights, where you combine them with very, very low light image. It's that the strobe is already on the lowest setting. It can't go any lower. So that means that we have to do something else. Now, the first thing, of course, we can do when I look at Nadine, she's a little bit overexposed. So let's first try. And this is something that only the Sony cameras does well. Let's just try to underexpose this by two stops on the exposure compensation. So not flash, but normal exposure. And let's see if that's enough. Okay. Probably a little bit better, but still, it's not 100% perfect, but I'm getting there. And I'm not using any difficult stuff. Yes, in a week. What? The, the candle is almost down. I need another one. Oh, you need another one. Okay. Let's do another one. No, we don't have a smoke alarm that will respond to a candle, I think. So normally, when you do stuff like this, the first thing that people will do is actually use manual setup. I just want to show you that with exposure compensation and using your strobe or manual, you don't need to do that manual stuff. Just relax in your head and remember the theory behind it, because that's so important. If you understand what lighting does and what the settings on your camera do, you don't have to do that important stuff like, okay, let's calculate this. Don't. Just keep it easy, because getting the shot is more important than, well, nailing it with, look at me, I did it with exposure compensation or whatever. I'm going to go to minus 2 instead of minus 3. And I think now we have a perfect balance. I really like this. If I like the strobe a little bit less, there's a little technique called feathering. So what I now can do is by feathering my light further away from my model, I get less light on my model. So let's just do that. I'm literally just turning it like an inch or a few degrees, not more. And now you can see that we really have that nice accent lighting. Let's see if we can get it a little bit under her chin or under her jawline. Let's just draw it like this. There we go. Love it, Nadine. Really nice. There we go. This is awesome. Okay. Gonna use a little bit of that wide angle effect. 
Oh, sorry. Oh, that's nice. Awesome. Okay, Nadine on three, blow it out. One, two, go. Nice. Okay, let's see what we can do in Photoshop. But before we go to Photoshop, I have to do something that's really important for this one. I have to shoot a color checker. I'm going to explain to you in a second why for this one it's even more important. So let me grab that color checker very quickly. And can you turn on the candle again? Or turn on, just... You know what I mean. <laughs> Click. <laughs> it's very important that I turn off my small strobe at the moment. There we go. Hold this in front of your face. Okay. Let's go back to zero. Um, and the, a candle in front of it. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, let's see what we can do. Okay, let's go to the computer. And then they are going to do the new set. And in the meanwhile, we're going to do the selection of the images. And of course, show you some images in Photoshop, what you can do with it. Okay, we will go to a commercial first. We will be right back. Hey guys, my name is Frank Dorhoff and I'm a fashion celebrity photographer based in the Netherlands. But most of all, I love teaching you guys about photography. Now, what is the main ingredient of photography? The model, of course, your camera, but most of all, lighting. Photography is painting with light, telling your story with light. And so light is the most important thing in photography. But still, 99% of the photographers let the lighting control them. While in essence, you as a photographer should be able to control the lighting. And that's why this video is created. It's a video about the essential lighting techniques, the lighting techniques that you should learn. How to create a white backdrop or how to create a black backdrop. How to make sure that there's still shadow in your lighting. But most of all, how about the essential lighting like Rembrandt, butterfly, feathering your light, making sure that your model is lit the correct way. In this video, we're going to do all those techniques and way more. Very simple tips about how to control your shadows. We talk about light meters. We talk about my favorite plugins. If you're a starting photographer, this is the video for you. This is where you learn everything you need to know about lighting. And after that, you can start telling your story with great lighting. If you're a professional, I'm sure there are a lot of tips in here that also help you. So enjoy our new instructional video available now. Hey guys, welcome in the Netherlands, Amsterdam. This is my home country and my name is Frank Dorov. Working with models, that's what I love to do. That's where my main passion is. Working with models gives you the option to create something amazing. I try to really dig in deeper. And to dig in deeper, you have to make sure that your model is at ease. How do you pose your model? How do you style your model? How do you make sure that your image really tells that story? If you want to know more about working with models, Check out my class on coaching and working with models on kelby1.com. Okay, and we're back. So what did we do and what did I explain? Now, I get a lot of questions about ETTL, about manual mode. Now with small strobes or speed lights or system strobes, I don't know what you want to call them, they're all the same. There is a very, very simple trick that you have to realize. When you use a camera, there's something called exposure compensation. That's often the dial on top of your camera. You can choose that, for example, if you shoot a snow landscape and you don't want the snow to be 18% gray, you dial it down or up. Up, yes, of course, because you want to overexpose. So in other words, if you dial it up, the shutter speed will go down, yes? That works perfectly. And if you're in T mode, of course, in tie mode, the aperture will open up. So. If you click up, you will actually get more light. If you click down, you will get less light. Now, when do you use less light? For example, a cityscape. If you want to shoot a cityscape, everything is dark or a dark mine or whatever. 
you have to make sure that it keeps dark and not become 18% gray. Now that same technique, exposure compensation, you also have on your strobes, but now it's called flash exposure compensation. Now in some cameras, those are connected, like on a wire. So if you say, okay, let's do um, exposure compensation minus three, automatically flash exposure compensation will also go to minus three, which can be, can be handy, but I like them to be separate. If they are separate, you can do something that's really cool outside. For example, create day to night. You could set up your camera, very simple for shoot running gun. Put your strobes on zero, so no exposure compensation. Put your camera on minus three exposure compensation. Now everything you will shoot will become day to night because the dark sky will turn even darker and the strobe is on zero. Now if you have a camera that doesn't have that go by wire system, so where you actually have them separate, Oh, sorry, where you are using a cobalt wire. Now what you have to do is do your exposure compensation on minus three and your flash exposure on plus three. Because now it's underexposing by three. It's also underexposing the strobe. So you're actually giving your strobes three more to end up at zero. So look in your camera which system is used, if they are combined or if they are separate from each other. Now what I did is what a lot of people will do Otherwise, when you want to do a candle, a lot of people will go into manual mode and just try to figure out how it works. You saw that it's way easier and way faster to just set it up with um, aperture priority mode, just see how it looks and then start adding your strobe. And now you can balance it very, very simple with exposure compensation and flash exposure compensation in combination with each other. It sounds very complicated. Trust me, you saw me doing it. It's incredibly simple. Just don't overthink it. That's the biggest problem, overthinking stuff. Okay, so let's see which images we have and what we can do with them. So let's do picture in picture again. And the first thing, of course, you might wonder is, Frank, why the heck did you shoot a color checker? Well, always in my computer, I have a profile active for my camera, which we created in Capture One. In this case, however, the color temperature is totally off because we are using a candle. Now let me show you how it looks when we're just using a color correction on that candle. So everything will turn blue. So let's select all our images uh, here and let's do sync, adjustments, copy and apply. And it's only color balance. Okay, and you will immediately see, let me delete everything else one moment let me delete this okay so everything will turn blue as you can see here and why is that happening well very simple if you correct for the uh, for the candle you will see that automatically my strobe will get a blue tint and this is interesting because this is the same thing that you can, for example, do in your studio when you're using red gels or blue gels or green gels. It doesn't matter. As long as you have two different color temperatures in one image, one will shift. The problem is, which one do you want to switch? Now, of course, when you shoot something with a candle, you like that red hue, right? Because that gives that idea of a candle. When I look at this, I go like, everything in my mind now just screams this isn't right. Because a candle that's blue, uh, this is weird. In all honesty, the candle isn't blue. Look very, very closely. The candle actually is neutral. My strobe has turned blue. I don't want that. I don't like it at all. But I did my correction. So what I'm now going to do is very simple. Go into your settings. And we have the same settings in Lightroom. You have the same settings in On One or Luminar. It doesn't matter. In your raw converter, those settings you can find. And go to White Balance. Now you see two things. Kelvin and Tint. For now, don't touch the Tint. The only thing we're going to do is Kelvin. It's now 1430. Let's very, very slowly bring in a little bit of the warmth of the candle. There we go. Now this for me looks way more like a candle with a little bit of window light, for example. So let's select all images. Uh, let's copy adjustments, select all and apply adjustments. And now on all these images, you will get a way nicer tint. Now, when you go back from the beginning, you can immediately see that when I'm using normal strobes, this doesn't make any sense at all because everything is blue. That's correct, because the strobes aren't the candles. You see? So this is why it's important to always shoot that color checker. And a lot of people don't do it, forget it, don't, because it is essential to getting your proper color balance. 
Okay, so let's find some images with my... Um, I actually love this one too. Let's take this one too. Um, uh, this one is interesting. And then with the strobes. I like this one. Now this one is a little bit overexposed, but hey, that isn't a problem. We can always bring that back, give a little bit of contrast. Maybe play a little bit with the highlights, shadows. And I actually like this shot too, so give it five stars. <coughs> Let me see if we have nicer ones. This is okay, but it, yes, just give it five. Okay, this one we can delete. And a lot of people ask me like, Frank, what do you look for in a shot when you select it? Now, do you remember the DVD from Shrek? Yes? Now, when you opened up the DVD from Shrek, there was something new that you never saw before on a DVD. Let me lower the volume just a little bit because I see it peaks. DVDs had these animated menus. And this was cool because sometimes you saw a bird flying or something else. But with, uh, with, with um, Shrek, there was something else. You know Donkey, the little monkey in the, the, the movie? It was actually jumping up and down. Pick me, pick me, pick me. And it sounds really weird, but I select the images the exact same way. It isn't that a monkey is jumping in Capture One, of course. Don't look for that firmware update. It isn't there. But I do it the same way. An image for me just jumps out. It immediately says, pick me, pick me. And it can be a curve. It can be a, a certain way that the light falls, a certain story. And the second question is, of course, how important is technique at that point? Now, let's say that I really, really dig this shot, and I actually do. So let's give this five stars. But let me just zoom in and let's see what's going on with this shot. When I zoom in on the eyes, you can actually see that the eyes aren't sharp, but her hair is. How important is that? It's very, very important. But if this image is better than one that the eye is in focus, I will still pick this image because it tells a story. It evokes emotion. And in all honesty, evoking emotion is way more important for me personally than having a shot that's technically perfect. So let me see which one I selected. Now, this one was still with the old color temperature. I didn't use a color checker. Ah, oh, Frank. So just do it like this for now. It's not perfect, but hey. There we go. Just give it a little bit. And select both images and copy those settings. And again, this is not how you should do it. But in this case, I have no other option. I actually like that one way more. Mm, I like them both. Okay. This one is very cool. This one is nice. I actually like this one less. Which actually solves my problem. Because I think with this one, the eyes are a little bit sharper. No, also, same problem. How did that happen? Eh, doesn't matter. It's one of those days. Okay, let me see. Let me make them a little bit even. Let's give this one a little bit more mood. And this one a little bit less. Okay, this looks nice. And this one also a little bit more. Okay, let's go to Photoshop. And let's see what we can do. For Photoshop, I'm using TIFF 16 bits uncompressed Adobe RGBs. And of course, we're going into Photoshop 2020 or 2020. Leave comments below if for you it's 2020 or 2020. And a week wants me to say 2020. I want to say 2020 or whatever. What do you want me to say? 2020. 2020. Or just 20. Or just 20. We're 20s. No, we're not. <laughs> okay, first things first. Now, if you saw a lot of digital classrooms, you already know what I do for the skin. I'm using a filter called Image Normal Portraiture, and I'm always running that in an action. Now, of course, you guys can argue like, hey, Frank, why don't you do dots and burn? Why don't you do frequency separation? Uh, let me put it this way. If you go to your work, why don't you go crawling? Why don't you go with the boat? Why don't you go swimming? Why don't you go standing on your hands? Why do you take a car? Because it's faster. That's why you use a plugin. Now, if you only retouch once a week, do it manually. If you retouch the amount of images that we do to your work, right, you use a plugin. But the plugins aren't cheap. So that's why I say if you do it a lot, use a plugin. Otherwise, don't. Okay. So what I did is I run the plugin. You see that on this layer with a mask over it, the black mask. Take white paint. And at that point, I can literally just take the effect out where I want it. 
And what I do is I normally do it pretty rough, like you see here. So I'm not really picky about hairs or areas around the eyes. I try to do it as nice as possible, but I'm very, very sloppy. And in the end, this saves work. Believe it or not, you can better be sloppy at the start and save a lot of time later on. Okay, now I'm going to use a little trick. I'm going to turn the backslash on. And now I can actually see where I paint it. And now I can take out any problems. There we go. Some people say, why don't you paint it with the backslash activated? Well, somehow it doesn't work for me that way because I can't see what I'm doing. Okay, this is better. Now I'm actually going to zoom in 100% and switch over to black. And this is, I think, the most important thing, although in this image nothing is really 100% sharp. Oh, great. And what I'm now going to do is with black, I'm just going to take the effect out in the areas where I don't want it, like on the hairs over here. Ooh, this is a really not so nice image. Sorry, guys. Okay, just go here. And there's, of course, a lot of noise that you can now see. So when I'm smoothing, I'm also taking away the noise from the camera. And this is a pretty high ISO because, hey, we're using candles. So I ha also have to solve that whole problem with noise. But this is actually pretty simple, because we're going to do that in the next step. There's a question. There's a question. Yes? Ask you the question. Can put on the microphone? Yeah, I, I, I think it's better if you do it via microphone. I guess. Yes, then okay. people can hear you. Well, okay. Uh, do you always do post-production in the bat cave? I mean, is it better in the dark? <laughs> I'm Batman. He doesn't know how to <laughs> respond. Um, I normally will do all the retouching in the dark, but it's not dark, dark. Um, the thing is, it's most important that you don't have direct light hitting your monitor. That is why, actually, when you look at the BenQ monitor on top here, it's actually using a sun hood. So this is my retouch screen, the Wacom Cintiq. And up here you can actually see the BenQ monitor with um, actually a sun hood. Now, the reason we're doing it like this is the BenQ is very, very good with colors. It's very accurate. It shows a lot of shadow detail, highlight detail. The Cintiq is absolutely amazing to retouch on, but it's a really, really bad monitor, especially the one I have here. Uh, I wonder if it's even better than sRGB. Probably it's slightly better than sRGB, but it's, it's not that good. And... When I retouch only on the Cintiq, it happens a lot that I miss some shadow detail or that I miss a cable that's running somewhere because it's in the shadows. The BenQ will immediately show that. Now, the sun hood actually takes away all the scatter light that we have in our studio. Now, the most important thing is that behind you or on top, there is no light because that's hitting on the monitor. So when I retouch at home, that's what we call the bed cave. I also have a bed cave at home. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Anyway, so when I retouch at home, we have exactly the same thing. We have a darker room where I retouch, but still there's a lot of light coming in from windows, but they don't hit the monitor. When you retouch, make sure that you have a setup that doesn't change a lot. So when you use windows, don't because window light changes. If you have a light behind you and it doesn't reflect on the monitor, there's no problem at all because that light is constant and that is how you set up your monitor. So, yes, you can do it with lighting, but better is without. Okay, so now I've done this. So you can see before and after. And my thing is always I flatten my image. And now I will just zoom in. And I will go in with the healing brush. And I will literally just take out a little bit of this. Not a lot. And you see that I'm not doing it on a separate layer, which is actually pretty stupid. But I've done this before. But if you don't, or if you're not secure enough, do it on a separate layer, because then you can always go back. Okay, it looks well enough. And there we go. Okay, now, to have a little bit of grain in there, now, in my case, I'm going to use a plugin. If you don't want to use plugins, don't worry, you can do it without, but in my case, I am. So let's go to Exposure Software, Exposure 5. And what I'm now going to do is, first I'm going to determine the look of the image I want. And the cool thing about Exposure 5 is that you can hover over several looks and just see what you like. Now in this case, I want to make sure that I choose something that's fitting for a celebration. So I want a little bit more contrast in there maybe, a little bit more funky looks. 
Let me see. I don't want to use... This, this is pretty... No oh, wait a minute. This is pretty nice. I like this. I like this a lot. Okay, now I zoom in to 100%. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that I have some grain in there. So in every single emulator of films, you can actually find a grain setting. I, I never saw an emulator that doesn't have grain. So go here for grain. And don't overdo it. And what I always do is I never do it with color. So as you can see now, there's a lot of color noise in there. I don't want that. So I will do color variation on zero. That will make it black and white in this software. And I don't want it a lot. So just turn it down to zero and then build it up to hero. Just where you want to be. There we go. Now when I look at the shadow areas, I don't really like it in the shadow areas. Because as soon as you see grain in shadow areas, you might think, hey, that's a bad camera. Or it takes away a little bit of that magic. So in the shadow areas, I will actually pull it down. In the mid-tones, I will pull it down a little bit. And then to make the skin look a little bit better, I will actually put it in the highlights. And what you're creating now is a little bit of pores. Like, it looks not that flat anymore. You get a little bit more of that idea of natural skin. Of course, you can do the roughness. Let's make that a little bit less. So making the pores a little bit smaller. And now look at the difference. Before, it's a little bit glowy, the skin. And after, this looks way better. So it's actually a sort of noise that you don't really see unless you zoom in. And it just gives a nice image. And again, the image is a little bit unsharp. I don't know what's why. Maybe it's the 50th anniversary. It's one of those days. <laughs> okay, so now as soon as the filter is running with grain, it always takes a little bit of time. The only thing I now want to do is just open up the eyes a little bit because we didn't use any artificial lighting, um, only in the candle. So what happens is that the pupil will actually dilate, get smaller. And that means that you actually get a nice iris. So in this case, blue, which is really nice. So let's just lower this just a little bit. Yeah. Sorry guys, but my Wacom somehow we calibrated it a few times. I mentioned that in the previous digital classroom, we calibrated it a few times and still we have big parallax errors on this unit. There we go. Okay, remember the 80%. Go to 100% and go to the dodge tool. And now only go over the iris very quickly, like this. One time, and then do one more in the dark area. There you go. Okay, just enough to get the eyes just a little bit. Don't overdo it because then you get those scary demon eyes, which you don't want to do, of course. Okay, so let's do a layer flatten image and let's save this one. And the next one will be a lot faster for one very simple reason. When you've done this, the next one is simply copy and repeat. So let's do this. Control D. And just run again that filter, ultra smooth. Let's go to white. And let's do it now nicely. So before I did it rough, let's now do it nicely and try to keep being uh, in between the lines. I feel like I'm drawing again. Painting. No, uh, coloring. That's it. In case you don't know, I'm Dutch, so English is not my native tongue. So sometimes I talk total rubbish. But you get the attention, intention, I hope. Okay. It helps that the images isn't, aren't totally in focus. Again, I don't know what's going on. Normally the Sony is 100% with the focus. But I think because we had a false, false start, I'm a little bit off my upper pole, which is Dutch. It's actually French, I believe, but anyway. Okay. And you see that this takes way more time than just going over it like, like a madman and then just correcting it. But hey, it's what you want to do. Sometimes I do it like this, sometimes the other way around. Okay, fit on screen. Take it down to a little bit less. This is nicer. Layer flatten image. The only thing I now have to do is run exposure software. an image again. Weird. Ah, there we go. 
And the cool thing about the exposure solver is you don't have to do anything anymore. You just press apply. You don't even have to see the image, just press apply because it remembers the previous setup. And I think a lot more manufacturers should do this. There are so many plugins where when you open them up, you have to start from the start again or select the preset you, you used and you have to remember that. And well, sometimes it helps remembering stuff. Sometimes you just go like, what the heck was I on? Like, what I was on? setting one, two or three or maybe 600, I don't know. So it's cool that the software actually remembers what you used before. Okay, it's still running. Again, when you use grain, it takes a long time, but it's almost there, there we go. The previous one, we ended up on 80. With this one, I think we're gonna end up a lot lower because it's a way more contrasty shot, but I still want that look in. So this is a little bit too little. Let's go a little bit up. There we go, this is much nicer. Yes. Okay. And also because it's a more contrasty image, we're gonna do the eyes again. And I'm gonna now show you the difference. Because it looks like I don't do a lot, but when you take it out, there's a huge difference. Okay. See before and after. So it just opens up the eyes a little bit more. File, close, and save. Oh, sorry. Layer, flatten image, and file, close. Okay. okay. Well, the other images, you probably already know how to retouch them, so I'm not gonna do that during Digital Classroom. It's a little bit shame of the time, of course. We're going to go to the next set. We're going to do a small commercial break because I have to set up a little bit. And then we're going to do something which I just heard also includes a little bit of motion. So, yeah, very nice. If, if, if something goes wrong, it will be in the next set, I think. So keep watching and don't laugh. In this tutorial, we're actually going to show you that you can make great images with very, very simple tools. What to think about a tungsten light bulb? The LED panel. A ring light. A standard flashlight. The Fresnel. The Westcott Ice Light. Smartphones. Loom cube. The chandelier. Christmas lights. We call them light snakes over here. This is one of the most creative lighting videos I ever created. I'm very enthusiastic about it. It's available now via our website. See the links. Hey guys and welcome to our studio in Amelot. My name is Frank Doroff and today I want to talk to you guys about something that we get a lot of questions about. Hey Frank, how do you like this image? Hey Frank, what can I improve in this image? And of course I love to help you guys out. But online I mostly am limited to just saying hey I really like it or continue like this or change this. I, I can only do short images because let's be honest we get so many questions. So that's what actually got us thinking. And we started a Patreon. Now, what is a Patreon? Well, let me put it this way. Do you want an extensive photo critique every month? Do you want the bed phone where you can directly contact me with any questions you have? Do you want to be a member of a group that's closed off on Facebook that have the same interest as you guys? That isn't about putting people down, but it's actually about helping people progress in their photography and retouching. Well, that's our Patreon. Now, by joining our Patreon, every month you can deliver one or two images. We're not that strict about it. And I will do a whole video. In that video, I will show you how I would do the retouching, what I would change about the shot, and I give you a whole lot of tips. That video is put online on a closed-off website. And it means that only the guys from Patreon can see that video and help you out. So I help you out, and the whole community helps you out. It's just an awesome way to learn. So... If you like what we do, of course, the first thing you can do is subscribe to our channels, leave comments and smash that like button because we really like it and tell other people about it. But if you want to do a little bit more and help us out creating the awesome programs you enjoy, like Behind the Closed Doors, Digital Classroom, 
quite frankly, our upcoming podcast, Beyond Photography with the Doorhoffs, and a lot more, then please join our Patreon. I already know you're absolutely going to love it. So head on over to the link below and start joining our awesome group on Patreon and get a lot of benefits. Thank you so very much for supporting our work. See you online. And we are back. Everything is set up. Let's go to the studio and let's see what they did. It's going to be complicated. I already know that. So let's switch over to our height cam. Okay, so you see the setup. It's actually when you know the work of uh, several very famous photographers. This is a setup that is very, very popular. Um, it's a setup that creates a certain mood and a certain look. So let's just set everything up the way that I want it. So I have one light on the back that creates depth. At first I'm going to turn this one off. And we have two strip lights from the side, both with light tools grids. So they're gray grids. They're really nice. And I'm going to aim them from the back on my model. At the moment they're on full power, and they probably will stay on full power. But they're both going to give side lights. Now when you use flat lighting, side lights can be incredibly important. Because if you use side lights, you create three-dimensionality. Uh, let me turn on the modeling light. There we go. So normally when you use, for example, high contrast lighting, you always use lighting from one side and you get a shadow area. So you get one lit area, one shadow area. Now when you use flat lighting like a big softbox from the front, in this case the 1.2 meters, you don't have that. You have light straight on your model, it just looks flat. So by creating excellent lights from the side, you're actually using highlights instead of shadows. And that also creates three-dimensionality. And that's where it's all about, three-dimensionality. So let's ask the model to come on the set, because she just disappeared again. Nadine, where are you? Oh, there you are. I didn't see you. Okay, let's turn on the camera. Let's go for, of course, ISO 100. Not auto ISO, because now we're using the big strobes. There we go. Okay, and let's grab a light meter. Because that's going to be important for now. Um, remote control on a week. Thank you. It works. Yep. <laughs> Nadine knows. Okay, can you step one step forward, please? Awesome. First thing I'm going to meter is my main light. 11.5, side light. 5.66, 16.1, huge difference. Why does that happen? No idea. What you can do is, of course, meter everything separately. You don't have to. Look at how the light is aimed. Remember that I'm using strip lights with a grid? The grid channels the light. So when it channels the light and it isn't aimed directly at my model, you will get a lot more light output. For example, if I aim it here, I also get a lot more. So make sure that you aim your light source directly at your model. Very, very important. Okay, let me see. This is nice. And I'm going to block off the rest of the light for a second. 11. Nice, block of light. 16.1. And that's correct because this one is exactly one stop more sensitive than the other one. So that's now also F11, and my front light, 11.4. Perfect. So let's go down on the front light, 1, 2, 3, 4. And the rest we have to turn up again, 4. There we go. And there we go. Okay, let's grab a camera and shoot this on F11 and see what happens. Oh, Fred, you can come in if you want. Okay, there we go. We have an audience today. You don't hear them, but they're shouting, but you don't hear them on the microphones. It's ridiculous how much noise they make. Okay, there we go. 
Nice. So by using a light meter, you exactly know what's going to happen. You know that those accents are there. You know that the look is right. The only thing, of course, is that color balance. What's going on? Remember that I set it up before in a different color balance? This is why you use color checkers. So let's grab the color checker again. Huh? An Oompa Loompa. Nah, more a Smurf. Okay, let's very quickly do this. Okay, so now we're gonna set proper white balance. And after that, we're done, we're ready. Well, we're not done yet, but okay. Let me set up color white balance. There we go. Okay, so now we have proper white balance. I like the setup, but if you can look in the back, you can see that there's a little bit of tension there. It's a blue backdrop, but it isn't an interesting blue backdrop. It's just blue. So what do you do with blue? Let me first take some shots so you can see what I mean. It's nice. It's okay. But it's not really exciting yet. So let's turn on that last strobe on the back. That little bit of an accent. I'm going to use a 1000 watt for that. I'm going to put it on full power. So this one is actually twice as strong as my main light in, in watch. Nadine, can you step one step that way? Perfect. Nice. I love that sound. The exploding strip. Awesome. So now you can see that behind my model we have this really nice light. Ah, but I'm still missing something. I'm missing a little bit of power, a little bit of fun. So let's add a little bit more on the actions. And this is what I call cooking with light, where you literally just don't Trust that light meter anymore. Just trust your eyes. What do you like? So give it a little bit more. And do the same thing on the other side because we have to balance them. There we go. Nadine, lovely. There we go. So now we have very, very strong accent lights. It's almost to the point of blowing out, but in this case, I really like it. But I think we need something else, and that's why we invited an audience. <laughs> so, are you ready, audience? Yes, we are. Because with the 50th anniversary of Digital Classroom, we, of course, need something special. And that's why, all the way from America, we have here Mr... No, it's just my audience, sorry. So, are you guys ready? They're climbing stairs. Say, say when you're ready. Okay, throw it towards Nadine, right? Wait a minute. One, two, three, go. One. One, two, three, go. Nadine, hands a little bit closer. One, two, three, go. Nice. And... Nadine, if you look down and just have a big... Yes, that's nice. One, two, three, go. The nice thing about this stuff is that it actually floats a little bit. So you don't have that where you, you throw paper and it doesn't work, or you throw something that's more heavier and it goes down faster. With this stuff, it really floats a little bit. So it's a bigger material, and it looks very nice when you throw it. Do you have more? Yeah. Okay. Are you ready, guys? One, two, three, go. Nice. And Nadine, can you turn around? And when I say yes, turn around very violently. Is that doable on those heels? Yeah. Okay. Guys, are you ready for throwing? Nadine, turn on five. And you guys throw on three. One, two, three, four, five. Turn on five. You guys throw on three. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. 
Watch out for your uh, skirt. So throw on three, turn on five. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, something went wrong. Yeah. Did you kill yourself? Don't do that. You're good friends of us. Okay, throw on three, turn on five. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. Okay, let's see if that's something that's interesting. Love it. Okay, so let's see what we can do with this in Photoshop after we did something else. Nadine, can you pick up the 50? May I show one for my grandchild? He has his birthday today. Yes? Will you take the picture one? Oh, and you throw it? Yes. Of course. But do you want to be in, the, in front of the camera? Uh, no. No. So what do I have to do? Oh, a behind the scenes image. Yeah. Where you sh oh, okay. So then I will zoom out a little bit. Okay. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> okay, now you're on. Okay, on three, uh, sorry, you, you just throw on three and Nadine just stand still. Oh, sorry. One, two, three. Nice. One more. One, two, three. A little bit more towards the model. One, two, three. Okay. okay. Just lower the five. Oh, just stand like that. Okay, we're going to move a little bit further back. Let me see if we have something cool. Okay, throw on three. Uh, and, and Nadine, can you put a little bit that way? Perfect. Okay, throw on three. One, two, three. Okay, let's see what we can do in Photoshop with these. Because I think we have enough. For this, we need a little bit of a special retouching technique, which I think can benefit a lot of you guys that like to work with these kind of backdrops. And thank you so very much for our audience to help us out. That's, of course, where they were invited. <laughs> you get that right, yes. Okay, let me see. Um, first of all, let me go through the images. And which one do I like? This one is a little bit too depressing, so let's take that one out. I love this one. This is really nice. This one is also really cool. This one is nice. And we have some 50. This one is nice. This one is nice. Okay, now we have some images that are nice, but not all images have the proper amount of, well, stuff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first retouch this one because this one has the right amount and all the other ones we can maybe borrow some of the uh, confetti from another image. So let's just first try it with this one. Now, because I'm using a light meter, I don't need to adjust anything, but if you want to adjust something in your raw converter, it's better to do it in the raw converter because there you have a lot of latitude. So let's say that I want a totally different look. I don't, but you could do it in your raw converter, just play around a little bit. And as you can see, I end up almost where I want, where I was, so don't do that. There we go. Okay, let's go into Photoshop, Control D. For Lightroom, that's Control C, by the way. And let's make a nice square image, which is perfect for Instagram, of course. So let's do, I'm not gonna do completely square, by the way. Let's do it like this, a little bit of square. So I'm just gonna cut off the corners. There we go. Now, the first thing, of course, you want to do is make sure that that backdrop is totally equal. So, meaning that you don't see any, um, like, uh, creases or other stuff in the backdrop. Now, you can do that with very, very simple tools. It's incredibly simple. So, just go here. And you can do two things. Normally, with these kind of backdrops, you can do this. Select the Harry Potter stick and just go to Select Subject. Now, in this case, I don't think it's going to work because we have a lot of confetti. But who knows? Now. No, it's not okay. Okay, so take your Harry Potter stick, just hold 
or in this case it's of course sorry the shift key and just select everything except the confetti so only blue you can do color selections or whatever but i just like to do it this way there's so many different ways to do this but for me this works fast enough and the selection can be really really sloppy for example this is already way too nice actually just make sure that around your model everything is selected except of course the confetti Okay, there we go. Perfect. Be nice and sloppy, but make sure that nothing of the model is selected. So when you do this, make sure that nothing of the model is selected. Absolutely nothing. Okay. Go to select, go to modify, and just feather it a little bit, like maybe three or four pixels. That's enough. Okay. Now we're going to do select inverse, and we're actually going to cut out the model. So edit, cut. So now I have no model. I only have this. So now what I can do is go to filter, blur, do Gaussian blur, and just blur the heck out of it. Like for example, 170, more than enough. Now sometimes you will get these really nasty, almost like um, bit depth problems. I don't know how to call it, a solarizing effect or whatever you want to call it. To counter that, just add a little bit of noise. And you don't need a lot, 1% of noise. But make sure it's Gaussian noise monogrammatic. So 1% is more than enough. In this image, it doesn't really show up. When you have a gray backdrop, you will immediately see those lines. It just looks terrible. But anyway, this also doesn't look right. So what we now have to do is edit, and then paste special into place. And now I actually placed everything back. So this is the new backdrop. Oh, sorry, this is the old backdrop. This is the new backdrop. And that's, that's a huge difference, of course. And hey, we're Dutch. We don't want to change backdrops every single day. So, flatten image. And now I can just retouch my image like normal. So I'm going to do ultra smooth. So that's image normal portraiture run in the backdrop. I'm uh, going to go to 100%. going to take a brush with a white paint. I'm going to close that up in a moment. As you can see, these images are a lot sharper. So, again, sorry for the previous set. I think I was still frustrated that YouTube didn't work. And then you keep thinking about that. And, well, you should actually think about focusing your camera. Okay. And, of course, with the power of YouTube, you can always rewind if I go too fast. And this is a really, really powerful technique, and I really like that. Okay, there we go. Okay, it looks pretty cool. View fit on screen. Love it. Forget the hands, and it looks terrible, so always make sure that you also retouch the hands. And then just lower the effect a little bit. I, I know what I'm doing, so I don't check it 100%, but normally I end up at 80, 85, so everything in between is okay. Okay, now that I look at this image, I go like, okay, what can I do? I can, of course, do a lot in Photoshop with, for example, exposure software, make it more interesting, give it a different look. But it's often way more interesting to just try to do it with stuff that you already have in Photoshop instead of expensive filters. Okay, so... How do you approach something like this? Well, let me just tint the image. So the first thing you can do is, this, of course, do this adjustments and then go to curves. And with curves, you can tint your image. So let me just show you that. So go to layer, adjustment layer with curves. Okay. Now, the first thing is that it's always on RGB. So now when I do something, it's actually global. So the whole image is affected, as you can see here. Uh, that's pretty cool if you want more contrast in your image or less. But in this case, I don't really want it like that. So let's reset. And then I forgot the reset button. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, go for first. I always first do the red. And in this case, I really like the red. So let's just give it a little bit of a boost in the. Let's use the mouse for that. It's really getting frustrated with the whole Wacom thing. And just take it away a little bit. You get a little bit of this, um, 
I don't know if you know those movies from the past where it, it was a little bit of a Technicolor look. So you get it by just raising the reds a little bit here and just pulling the reds a little bit there. And then finish it off with blue, the blue channel. And in this case, in the shadows, I want a little bit less blue. And just be very, very careful with this. There we go. And just add a little bit to the highlights. And you get that really nice soft look. There we go. It's very subtle, but if you turn it on and off, you can immediately see what I've done. It's a little bit like an Instagram filter, but way nicer. Okay, now go for filters. And actually, I have to do something before. One moment, guys, sorry. You have to store this. And do you know why you have to store this? Leave comments below. We'll wait one second to see if you guessed it. You have to store this for one very simple reason. We have more images in this set and I want the same look on all those images. So if I don't store this preset, I can never get all those images to look the same because normally in exposure software or DxO or whatever you use, you can create a preset and save that and do it again. With curves, of course, you can't do that. So save your curve. And you can do that very simple on the presets and just store it there. So let me just store the preset very quickly. Or should I just, I don't know. I think I'm going to do all the images differently. So let's just not save the preset for now. Let's just keep it that way. Yeah, you can copy him, but you know, when I, when I, I want to do them differently anyway. So just leave it for now. So if you want to save it, save it. Uh, I, you see, I have, some in, I have some here, but most of all, I, I don't want to, no, I don't want to save this. So I'm just going to try it. Okay, let's close this down. At this point, again, this is the difference. Let's say you want a little bit more red in there. Do a new layer. And let's just take a paint bucket with red. Drop it in. And then just, you can of course do this with your exposure slider, but this is often way too much and way too intense. So just go for soft light or overlay and just go very, very low. Don't even try to do this high, just like this. There we go, really like this. Maybe a little bit less. There we go. So you can see a preset is way easier, but I also want to show you guys stuff that we don't do with presets. Okay, so now that I've done this, I actually found out a very, very cool new technique. And this is really weird. So, do a new layer. And fill it again with red. Now, instead of going to soft light, go to the bottom and choose... I think it was saturation or you luminosity. There we go, luminosity. And just pull this all the way down and you get a little bit of a paintry effect. I never saw that before. I actually did it during a Patreon review and I found out that it looks absolutely amazing on some images. It just gives you that faded look as you can see here. So just by using it in luminosity, you get this really soft glow. It's almost like a painting. So it's absolutely nothing as you can see here. It's very, very slight but it affects the image a lot. So I really love that. Okay, flatten image. And now finally, we're gonna do one more thing. Uh, let me do that with the next one, because that's more fun. Let's do file close for now. Okay, cool. Because we have another technique that's also really nice. Uh, let me do that with the 50. Okay, control E. And I don't like the way that all my, um, oh, sorry, control D. I don't like the way that all my uh, confetti is actually scattered around. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to do this one again, control D. So now I have two images open in Photoshop. And I'm actually going to take some of the confetti from this one. Especially on this side. Edit, copy, and I'm just going to paste it in here. Paste. There we go. You can, of course, be very careful and just try to blend them together, but I can already tell you that will never happen. So just forget about that. 
And what you can just do is, of course you can lower your opacity, but then you also lose a little bit of those confettis. So what I will do on this layer is just very simple, just select and hold that shift key again and just select everything except the confetti. And it sounds so incredibly simple and it actually is. And just delete it. And there you go. So now I have my confetti on top. Will it look great? No, it will not. But because I'm actually doing a whole blurring the backdrop, etc., it doesn't really matter. It, it will work fine. So we have a lot of confetti over there. Let's do another confetti over somewhere else. So do paste. And let's do also some confetti over here. But I don't want it to look the same. So what I'm going to do is transform. Let's do a rotate 90% clockwise. Uh, that looks a little bit weird. So let's do another transform. Uh, let's flip horizontal. There we go. Looks better. Now actually they're all going down like this. So maybe just tilt it, transform, uh, rotate. I think this looks pretty funky. Let's do it like that. Now you have to be careful because the light hits it on certain areas, but I think this will be pretty okay. Okay, enter. And you do exactly the same thing again. You select everything except the confetti. Uh, let me see that I make a proper selection, yes. Do delete, and there you go. And now you've confetti on top. Now, of course, there's a little bit of a black area there. I don't know where that's coming from. Let me see. Ah, that's from that layer. And we're not going to do anything spectacular with it. We're just going to use the eraser tool. And just take that out. There we go. Okay, it looks pretty nice. And, of course, you can still drag the confetti around if you want. That's... Ooh. No, anyway... You can also use warp, yes, of course. Let me just first try to get it in here. Uh, let's try a little bit with the eraser tool and a little bit around here. Didn't do a nice selection with that one. Okay, this looks pretty nice. And don't make it too perfect because people will say you photoshopped it. We didn't. <laughs> okay, layer flatten image. Let's make it square again. A little bit square. And again, for this one, I'm going to use different techniques. There we go. It's not too square. It's still a little bit. Okay, this is nicer. Cool. Okay, now we do the same thing as before. So I'm going to make my selection. Hold the shift key. Go everywhere. Uh, don't forget anything. Because that's very nice if you do not. If you forget something, it really stands out because that's the part that looks like it's been old uh, seamless instead of new. And when you select everything, it looks like new seamless. And I actually, I started doing this technique because when you, when you do jumping models or models that move around on high heels, your seamless paper will maybe survive for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, and then you can already buy a new one. And they're like 75 euros or 60 euros. So that's a lot of money if you have to do it every single week. So we started actually developing this technique and I never saw it before, but it actually makes it possible to create in just a few seconds a totally, totally brand new backdrop instead of seeing that it's old. Okay, let's do modify feather and let's do three pixels again. Edit cut. Perfect. Oh, sorry. Edit undo. Select inverse, of course, first. Edit cut. Okay, so now everything is gone. Then go to blur. Gaussian blur. There we go. Now we have a nice backdrop. Now add noise. 1%. Edit paste into place. There we go. And layer flat an image. And now we can do the same thing again. Ultra smooth. So I'm going to do the skin. And let's do for this one something special. I'm going to do it pretty rough. Okay. Let's go for 80%. 
Oh, there we go. Zoom in and just make sure that the eyes are sharp and the hairs. Make sure that the hairs stand out. So I'm going to take that out of the selection again to bring it back to the original state. Okay. Change it to white for any places you forgot. And there you go. Brighten up the eyes just a little bit with the dodge tool. Again, don't overdo it and never touch the eye white because that gives you a really weird look. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let me show you another technique which I really, really like and which you probably never saw before also, um, or maybe on my channel. Um, so when you look at color, everything is connected to certain colors, red, green, and blue. Those are your primary colors. So everything when you go into channels will have a red, green, and blue. Now you saw me doing the trick, I think a lot with the red channel. If you didn't, let me just show you very quickly, but this is something else. So let's go to a layer, just create an empty layer, go to your background, go to channels, go for the red channel or blue, whatever you want. Control A, Control C, if you're on a Mac, it's I believe, Command C uh, for selecting everything. No, Command V for selecting. Anyway, select everything and copy. Go to that empty layer on top, Control V. There you go, now you have black and white and just use soft light. And it gives you a really high intense image. So, but I'm not going to show, this is not what I wanted to show you guys, but it is connected. So everything has these three colors, red, green, and blue, but there are also secondary colors. And the secondary colors are divided by drawing a line from your primary color through the white point. Remember that 6,500 degrees we talked about in the beginning? That's in the middle of a triangle. So when we create a triangle, let's do this very quickly for you guys. File new. Oh. File, new, create. Okay, so when we look at colors, how they work, it's a little bit like this, or a little bit, it is actually like this. So we have this triangle, and here we have red, here we have green, here we have blue, and in the middle, we have a D6500 point. Okay, now when you draw a line from red through that point, you actually, <coughs> oh, I need mouses for this, this is just ridiculous. So when you go through here, you actually end up between green and blue. Now what is between green and blue, you might wonder? Well, that's cyan. So when you go from blue through that point, you end up here. What's between green and red? Yellow. When you go from green to the bottom part, you end up with magenta. So your primary colors are red, green, and blue. Your secondary colors are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Now, when you print, there's a third one, K. Now, a lot of people think that K stands for black. Black. Which it isn't. It's key. Now, in most instances, let's go back and let's show you what it is. So it's not black, it's actually key. Now, if you look at a printer, key is actually determined by black. Because if you look at a color, what you see now is two-dimensional. And two-dimensional means that you have an X and a Y. X, Y. But there's also a big Y. And this is key. So, X and Y are coordinates here. And the big Y is actually where it creates three-dimensionality. It looks amazing on this screen, but... Normally I do it a little bit nicer, but you get the idea. So this is what I'm going to use in this image. Now, when you look at a black and white conversion, what happens with black and white? A lot of people think you just lower your saturation, but that's not true. Let's go to your raw converter, for example, and let's go for black and white. Now, as soon as you go for black and white, oops, sorry. You will see that in black and white, you actually have master three-way, shadow, mid-tones, and you see all these colors. So why the heck do you need all these colors? Sorry. Why do you need all these colors, red, yellow? Why do you need them in black and white? Well, remember in the old days when you had cameras and you used certain types of film 
black and white film, you used a red filter or a blue filter. Why the heck would you use a filter if you shoot black and white? That's because certain colors react to that filter. And actually, that's the technique I'm going to use now. You go to adjustment layer, so you do a new layer, and you do new adjustment layer, and you do an adjustment layer black and white. Now, for a lot of people, that doesn't make any sense, because I want to make this picture in color, right? So why the heck do I create a black and white adjustment layer on a color image? We're not there yet. Remember key? Key is brightness of a color. Now, if you lower the key of a color, the color gets more saturated. If you raise the key of a color, a color gets less saturated, a little bit more like blown out, a little bit faded. You have to change the key. And what is key? Well, key, if you look in your blending modes, could be substituted by lumosity. So now I'm actually able to do not the X and the I, but actually the big I, the key. Nothing else is going to change. Now, this is not completely true, because if I turn this on and off, you can already see that there's a huge shift in the image. But that's because Photoshop uses this. So when I would reset this, it's not possible. So I really have to work with this. But that, that's not really a problem. So let's try something. Let's say that I want the reds to be more saturated. Well, no problem. Just pull this down. Sorry, guys. My pen, it's really frustrating. So go up. Go down. And the more I go down, the more saturated the color will become, but also more contrasty. Do you see that? So now let's say the yellows in the in the balloons. I want a little bit more. Uh, there's no green in the image, I think. Blue. Oh, yeah, on the back. Let's make that darker or lighter. We also have some cyan there. Now darker. Really like this. Magenta, sometimes it's in the skin tones. Let me see. No, it's actually in her dress. Look at that. Now it really pumps up that dress. So lower it in the reds, raise it in the magentas. Let's see what happens. No, don't like that. Do it the other way around. This red, I really dig. There we go. Okay, let's see the difference before and after. You can see that we just... Added a little bit of more accents. Now, this isn't... Well, let me put it this way. You can do this over the top. So, let's just do it over the top. Let's just really make this shine. Let's make this really dark. And let's just pump that magenta up all the way. And now you have you Instagram the heck out of a shot. In all honesty, I would never do this. So, I would like to balance it a little bit more. So, let's make the reds jump out. Let's go back for the blues. A little bit more cyan to make a jump. Is there any green? Nope. And there we go. I'm really picky by doing this. I really want the proper tone. There we go. Okay, awesome. Okay, for me it's now layer flat an image. Okay, now let's say that you want to enhance a little bit more color. That you go like, hey Frank, I really like this. I really like this trick, but I don't want to do it like this. Is there another way? Yes, there is. That's the cool thing about Photoshop. Go for layer. Go for adjustment layer. And of course, you can also do this without adjustment layers, by the way, but just using U and saturation or whatever. Okay, so when I use U and saturation, there's something else that really draws your attention. You see this colorize? That's cool. Because when you use colorize, you immediately see that the image changes, right? And you can do this, or you can do it the other way around. But it doesn't make any sense in this case. So, why not change again this for Lumosity? And see what happens when you colorize. You see that I'm now actually changing the brightness of my image, but only in certain areas. So, if I change my U, I can literally pinpoint one area where I actually change my color with Colorize. So, is there another way? Yes. Take out Colorize. And what you can do now is actually... And let me do that the other way. One moment. Let me take this out to make it a little bit simpler. Because you can see it slightly better. Okay. Now, when you look at this, immediately you see when I move, you see a little pointer. Okay, cool. Choose any color. Science. Doesn't matter. And go for the red for the flowers here. And just pump, pump the saturation only for that red. There you go. If you say, oh, I see a little bit of the skin going, just limit 
your way of working here. You can literally just pinpoint exactly which colors you want to be brighter or less. You can see now the skin is hardly affected anymore. Love this. Really nice. But let's do the blues too. Select any colors you want. Go for the blues. Change the saturation. And make it really pop out. Maybe lower the lightness just a little bit. Or maybe raise it. Whatever you want to do. It's personal choice. Nice. Okay, I want the same thing for the greens. Oh, sorry, for the yellows. Select one of the yellows. Make it jump out a little bit more. Maybe change the hue, you know? Maybe make them... Nah. Oh, it's also the skin tone. Do you see that? So be careful. Don't do too much with the hues. There we go. Okay. So I actually like it like this. What more can we do with this shot? I think just tint it. Now, tinting again... Many, many different ways. My personal favorite, without any doubt, exposure software. So do it again with exposure software and just find the one that you like. And in this case, let's do it a little bit more over the top, a little bit more pinup style. So I really dig this. Before, after, yes, I love this. It's a little bit overblown, which I don't mind. So let's go up for the highlights and just pull down the highlights just a little bit. But don't take away a lot of the sparkle in the image and just pry, press apply. Difficult word. Now I do see that I messed up somewhere. And this is why you should always do it on 100% and never during a live broadcast. Because that will mess you up. If you look here, you can see that there are some of the uh, particles in front of the balloon. And you can see that there's a little bit of, um, how do you call that? I didn't do that right. So in this case, I'm just going to leave it for now. But when you do something like this, make sure that you catch that. Because this looks a little bit weird. Now, of course, you can use Photoshop, of course. So what I now did is just use the selection tool. Just go over it and just delete it. Uh, sorry, edit, undo. And use content that I fill on some, and it will do a pretty good job. So overall, if you really are like, hey, I don't want this in my image, you should have taken care of it before. But afterwards, you can always use content that I fill. Thanks to Adobe, we have some really, really powerful tools. And this is why I don't stress a lot when I do a layer, flat an image. It's, it's so easy to just correct stuff afterwards. And it's not the right way, of course. Don't, don't, if you have the choice, don't do it. But you don't have to stress when something goes wrong. And should we also take this out? Yes. Looks ridiculous. And the final one is on here. And I don't like the black one. So I'm just cleaning up some stuff now. This one is okay, that one looks nice. Yeah, I don't, don't mind anything else. And it's 66 megapixels. Nobody will look at it one-on-one, -on -one, I hope. Don't spoil it to other guys. Okay, I think overall it looks pretty nice. So let's do a layer. Uh, oh no, just file close. Okay, anyway, do we have any questions? No, no questions. Really? No questions at all? That's weird. Okay, let's go back to Capture One for now. And let's try one more, and we're going to show you how to create the, the sides. I think that's interesting. Oh, don't take that one. It's an obscured shot. But I do like all the... Uh, this is a problem. Okay, let's do those both. And let's see if we can create one out of two. Because I don't think Nadine will like it if they look obscured like that. No. <laughs> are you okay, Desiree, or are you crying? <laughs> From fun or? Okay. One of our visitors is crying in her seat, so I hope it's from fun. Okay, so we don't want this. <laughs> we want this one. This is better. Okay, so how do we approach this? Now, I, I, of course, have both of those images, and I only want that bottom part to be different. Now, you can do one thing or you can do two things. Let's try it first the other way. And this is one of the things that I'm very, very bad at. So if it doesn't work out, don't laugh. Or a little bit. 
Let's select this whole image and let's just transpose it over this one. Okay, so now just lower the opacity. Okay, try to line them up. Yes. Good. Goodness, how did she keep the same pose like that? That's insane. Yeah, but we already got it. Bizarre. Just got the tip, do it on difference, and you can see the difference. There you go. So, yep, that's also cool. Looks weird. Looks like an art piece. Let's create an art piece. It's amazing. Cool. Okay, but let's keep it for now like this. So I want this image with, of course, well, these confettis. So why not do it like this? Why, why not just do layer, layer mask, reveal all? And now I can paint in the confetti. Or you can do it the other way around, undo. Depends on what is more difficult. Do it on image, uh, sorry, layer, layer mask, hide all. And now what I can do, and maybe this is easier, it depends on, you, on yourself. Now I can just close only this area. There we go. So this can be easier than just cloning in all the confetti or copying. I can even make the dress now a little bit bigger and more intense, as you can see here. Just be careful that you blend it in nicely. Here you can see a little bit of a problem area. So just take that out. And then this looks pretty cool. There you go. So before and after. Nice. Okay. So I promise you how to close up the sides. If you want to close up the sides, very simple. Take your marquee tool, make it as wide as possible around your model, and make sure you don't hit your model. So, for example, in this case, we have to place it here because of that little hair. Okay. Now, edit, transform, and just use scale. And what you do is you just... Oh, sorry, new Photoshop, forgot. Hold the shift key. Uh, no, the other shift key. One moment, guys. Edit, transform, scale, hold the shift key, and just drag it out. Do the same over here, and with the confetti, it's of course a little bit more difficult. Hold the shift key, edit, transform, scale, and do it like this. Works. Okay, let's go back. Control set, control set. There's a question, Frank. Okay. Do you ever add a texture to the whole image? If I add textures to the whole image, not really, to be honest. Okay. Another way, and that's thanks to Photoshop, is actually this. Select it with your lasso tool. And just press delete. And use content to where fill. Sometimes that's even better. Now, of course, it's running in a backdrop. Let me pull it here so you can see what's going on. Now, these are pretty big files, so sorry, guys, if it takes a little bit of time. Again, do it here. And also press delete. So you can do both ways. You can stretch it, but never clone, because when you clone it, it just, it just looks terrible. Okay, I need a little bit more confetti. So let me see if I have another image where I can use a donor confetti again. Okay, I'm going to use this one again. Control D. Okay. Let's take all the confetti. Why not? Select all. Ah, oh, come on. Edit. Copy. Uh, which was the one? Let me delete this one first. I don't want to have that one. Okay, there we go. Edit, paste. Okay. Let me just stretch this a little bit. Transform, scale. And hold the shift key. Guys, this I'm so sorry. You don't see what's going on here. But every time I try to select something in the menu, the pen doesn't work from the Wacom. I have no idea why, but it's getting really frustrating. 
Okay. There we go. Okay. Now do a layer mask. Hide all. Cool. Now lower the opacity just a little bit. So you can see what you're doing. Oh, that doesn't. One moment. That's my problem. Okay. Take white and just paint the confetti in. Because it's on the layer on the bottom. Now, of course, I get a little bit of the hand in. That doesn't matter. I get a little bit of her face in. And I'm taking some of the confetti out. But I'm first going to do it like this. There we go. So now I know where the confetti is. And I'll switch back to my brushes. And I can only just clean up the areas where I don't want, of course, to be cloning. Or it's not really cloning. It's more like getting the different layers in. Now, of course, it's better if you if you fill everything up with the confetti, but, you know, you have to throw it. It's pretty intense to throw it, and well, maybe it doesn't work the way that you want it, but this way you can still make it nice. Don't fill it up too much because that's a dead giveaway that you're actually just retouching stuff. Okay, layer, flatten image, and now we're actually done for this one. So just do the same thing we did before. Use your selection tool. Hold the shift key. Now there's a lot of confetti everywhere. But make sure that you don't select that. And that's why we, of course, have a very, very bright backdrop. And again, I'm very bad in compositing. And what I'm actually doing now is a little bit of compositing. But thanks to the new tools in Photoshop, you see that even somebody like me who doesn't know anything about compositing can literally pull this off. Now, don't ask me to change the backdrop because then I have to say, like, I can't. I can, but it will look a little bit more arty <laughs> because it doesn't look real. So I always go for the art side because then you can say, yeah, no, it looks crap, but I intended it that way. That's art. It's a perfect excuse. If something isn't right, just say that you intended it that way and that it's art. Art can be so many things. Okay, there we go. I think this looks pretty okay. Select modify feather. This is what I did wrong because if you feather it, and it's on blue, and you transpose it later on the balloons, remember, it will take a little bit of that blue with us. But because I'm blurring it, it's very important that I don't have any edges selected. Because, for example, if you have a little bit of red selected and you blur it, the red will actually spread out and you get a very, very nasty color infection. So you don't want that. Uh, okay, I forgot this selection, sorry. Okay, select inverse and edit cut. Okay. Filter Blur, Gaussian Blur, and do the same thing again. Add a little bit of noise. Again, with the blues, you don't see it really, but trust me, it's there. Okay, and edit, paste into place. Your model, a layer, a flatten image, looks really nice. And now you just retouch the image like you would do any image. So use your skin smoothing techniques or your tinting techniques or whatever you want to do. If you want to do Topaz Studio on a shot uh, or if you want to do uh, image normal portraiture, it doesn't really matter. As long as you just did that selection before, cleaned the skin, uh, sorry, cleaned the backdrop and then the skin later. Okay, now I did it the rough way. So everything is now affected by that filter. As you can see here, it looks absolutely terrible. So switch over the brush to black and just paint back where you want detail. So now I've shown you during Digital Classroom, I, I think, four different ways of doing exactly the same technique with the skin. And you have to determine for yourself what you like. If you do it like the hairs like this, I would actually do it a little bit more nicely to start with. Because now I have to get the hairs back and then go back again to white to make sure that the sides are correct. It's a little bit more work. But if you have a model that has normal hair, so not something like this, it's actually pretty easy to just only take the eyes back or the nose and then you're done. So just look what you like. Okay, let's go for 80%. There we go. Layer, flatten image. Let's take that dots tool again over her eyes. And of course you heard me saying Topaz Studio. Let me just show you what Topaz Studio can do for you guys. Let's go a little bit creative and out of the comfort zone. So let's go for Topaz Studio. And Topaz Studio, there was always a free version. I don't know if they still have a free version, but if you go on my website at the discount pages, 
you will find a discount code for Topaz, and I highly recommend Topaz Studio. It's really awesome. Let me just drag this to. And this from monitor. tomorrow, Topaz has a new deal with uh, Gigapixel. Oh yeah, that looks so really awesome. When it's live, I will promote it too. But that's also Topaz giving out uh, discounts. Awesome. Okay, so the first thing what I want to do is I want to add more contrast. So we have all these options here. Now we have, of course, creative stuff. We have stylistic, a remix, digital frames, edge, flare, glow, impression, radiance, smudge, texture. It's, it's insane. So let's just go for texture because somebody asked texture and you can put a texture behind your image. Now, in all honesty, this is not my thing. So as you can probably know. But the cool thing is that with textures, you can also go, okay, add another filter. Uh, let me just go for the stuff that I really do like. So I like to play with color and I like to play with precision detail and uh, contrast. So let's first start with contrast. Okay, first micro contrast. Micro contrast will give your image a lot more oomph. So you can do low contrast, which I don't like. I'm going to say that immediately. So just pull that back. But I do really like high contrast. And I also like micro contrast. Just look what it does on this clothing of the model. Add, add a little bit of shadow detail. And I just look at before and after. You can see that it just gives you, especially in the dress, it gives you way more oomph and detail. So I really like that. Okay, so now that we've done this, let's add another filter. And let's go for precision detail. And overall small detail, I like a little bit more. And I like a little bit of a boost also. Oops, that's way too much. There we go. So now you can really see the structure in her dress. So this looks even better. Okay, add another filter. Let's go for creative. What is bloom? That's something I never used before. Let's see what it does. Yeah, that's why I never use it, probably. No, that's not my thing. But that's no problem at all. You just go here, uh, and you go for Bloom, and you just take it out. And this is the nice thing. You can just literally just find what you like. And in my case, I will probably go for color teams. And for example, go for... I do something with red, maybe. Just make it a little bit more intense let's see original that's nice cool uh, and of course you can also do hsl so overall you overall saturation overall lightness yeah interesting but look at this you can do it per color so if i want my red saturation to be a little bit more or less i can just do it here and of course lower the brightness just a little bit so this photo uh, adjustment tool is just absolutely amazing. There we go. Okay. Uh, just save this. So accept. And let's go back to Photoshop. There we go. So I did it on a separate layer because there's one huge thing that I don't want. And that's actually I don't want it in the face of the model. So layer mask, reveal all. And take it out of the face of the model. Because the face of the model, I really want that original skin back. Uh, of course, do it with black. That works way better. There we go. Take it out of their hands. Okay. Nice. And I just love how it works on the dress. Look at the difference. It's a huge, huge difference. Okay, and finally, for the tinting, let's go back to exposure software. And yeah, let's do the same thing. The one with the vignetting, I really liked, so why do something else? Maybe in this case, take the vignetting out just a little bit. Uh, let me see. Maybe add a little bit of infrared. This is cool. And then just take the vignetting out. There you go. You get a little bit of that weirdness in the shot, which I really love. 
And overall, over here, you have the same options as before. You see that HSL, you see that coming back a lot today with the color temperature and also with your channels. And this is something that in previous digital classrooms I didn't give a lot of attention to, but I find out that every time when I show it, people just start e emailing me like, Frank, I never know that was there. Which is weird because you see it all the time, but somehow people just ignore it because they don't know how it works and it's so incredibly powerful. So guys, please, please check that out. HSL is absolutely stunning. And just press apply. And there we go. Okay, anyway, do we have any news which I have to share with the guys? Oh, yes, we do. Okay, so if there is no further problems with Corona, because we do have... Oh, let me do it on full screen. Yes, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go to full screen. Okay. So... If there is no problem with Corona, and let's just hope that there isn't, otherwise you will see me on trade shows. No, I'm not going to do that. But we will be in Brussels on March 13, 14, and 15 for photo days. I will be on the booth from FIDAC doing, I believe, four demos a day. Yeah, and we will give away free prints. Oh, by the way, I will show you the result of the image very quickly. So we ended up with this, which I do like. It's a little bit weird. It's different from what I normally do, but that's cool. Okay, so March 13, 14, 15 will be in photo days in Brussels. Then right after that, we are on professional imaging on March 28, 29, and 30. And we will be there, there on the live shoot theater. And we, are, we have our own booth for the workshops, click prop backdrops, and tether tools. Because we are the distributor for the Netherlands for click prop backdrops and tether tools. I practice click prop backdrops. And why did I do it again? Because now I did it wrong. Okay, on April 8th, we have another digital classroom, and that one will be a normal one. So not with a, it will be a different one. I mean, not with a model, but we're going to talk about styling during photo shoots. So we're just going to show you images which Nadine or I styled or anybody else. And you can see the different styling issues that come back. So it's going to be interesting, I think. I don't know if it's going to be a two-hour version. It can be that it's a slightly shorter version, depending on how we put it together. But we get a lot of questions about that styling part. So we want to talk a little bit about that. Then on April 25th, we are in Tilburg. May 16th in Os, Hayes. And then June 13 and 14 photo fair, first time for me. So make sure that you book that workshop because then they ask me back. And then for you guys in the UK, on July 20, we will be in the London area and July 25th in Birmingham. We have a special early bird on our website. The first five participants get the early bird. After that, we raise the price by 50 pounds for the rest. It's a limited group. Only 12 people are allowed every workshop for that one-on-one -on -one experience. So make sure you book it. You can book it on my website. Let me show you very quickly where that is. And we'll bring Nadine as the model. Yes, Nadine will be the model and she will do all the styling. And uh, Anna Week is also there. And our little dog is And also our dog, there. Chewie, of course, will be with us. If you want to meet us. our dog, so make join sure the workshop. Join the workshop. And the other thing, of course, is if you like what we do here, make sure you check out our instructional videos. They go in way more depth than, of course, Digital Classroom. Digital Classroom is more fun and cool. The instructional videos are the hardcore material. That's where we really go into depth and show you guys every single angle. And let me see what's more interesting. Of course, we have our Patreon. So that's the final thing we want to share with you guys. Please join us on Patreon. It starts at one buck a month. You get a lot of behind the scenes images. And I want to talk a little bit about behind the scenes images because I have something cool. And this is the cool thing when you stay till the end. Let me get a little bit of a drink. Now, of course, you guys love lighting setups, right? And you love it when people share those lighting setups. Now, normally when we share lighting setups for Patreon, we do it with our smartphone. You don't see those online, but we sh photograph every single light setup that we use for our Patreons. Again, it starts at one buck a month. Everything else is free for, I'm not going to do anything that you have to pay for it, but Patreon is something special. And we actually have something new. And that's this little bugger. It's a 360 camera from Insta. And the nice thing is now, normally when you shoot in a darker area with a 360 camera, it doesn't really work for the very simple reason it's too dark. The cool thing about the Insta360 is that you have an option that's called night mode. Now, 
I can't show you during the live broadcast, but if you go online in, let's say, well, when I'm at home, let's say in about an hour, on my social media, I will show you the image we're going to shoot now. It's now on a five second timer. I have a selfie stick connected to the 360 camera. I'm going to take my platypod off because the platypod is cool because then you can set it on the table. And the cool thing about the 360 camera, and a lot of people don't realize that, a lot of the manufacturers, they will go like, hey, our camera is smart. It clones out the stick. They lie. It doesn't clone out the stick at all. It stitches everything together. But look at this. You have two cameras, right? One and two. And they're 180 degrees. So everything that's in between this line isn't registered by the camera. So in other words, if you have a 360 camera, use a selfie stick. Your camera even the cheaper one will clone it out. It doesn't clone it out, it doesn't see it. It depends on the stitching software, of course, how nice the stitch is. But those selfie sticks, use any selfie stick. This isn't an Instagram, or oh, sorry, an Insta360 selfie stick. It's the cheaper one. Uh, it's crap, actually. I, I really want the Insta360 because it's much nicer. But it works, so yeah. Whatever. So I'm going to make it really long. And what I'm going to do is it's now on five seconds. I'm just going to take a picture on night mode. And it will count down. It will take like eight or nine shots. It's saving. And there we go. There we go. And now we have a 360. Now, during the workshops, I will give actually this camera to the model. And the model will hold it in front of her face and you can see the whole lighting setup. You can scroll through and you can determine like, hey, what's going on there? What does he show? So that's a new thing we're going to do for Patreon. You saw it first. And by the way, if you like this camera, if you like 360 cameras, this is the one I would highly recommend you guys getting. Thanks to the Graven partners who actually borrowed it to us. What is so special about this one, and we're going to do a full review on it, is if you look closely, you can first see that all GoPro accessories will fit, because it's in a GoPro-like case now. But there's something else. There's a battery on the bottom. You have one camera module, sorry, one camera module and one main module. This is the brain, and this is the camera. It's now fitted with a 360 camera, but you can take that camera off and put in an action cam, or a one-inch action cam. So it's a really versatile system. You don't need three cameras. You only buy one and you just buy different components. You can buy a bigger battery, you can buy different cameras. It's just absolutely amazing. And they even have a kit where you mount it on a drone. So one camera is on top of the drone, one is on the bottom. It's, it's just insane. And they have something called bullet time. It's just <laughs> highly, highly recommend this one. So kind of play with it a little bit more and then upload the images. Thank you so very much for watching, guys. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. We would like to thank Ineke, Fred and Desiree for being here. And of course my beautiful wife Anna Week and my intern Larissa and myself. Thank you so very much for watching. See you again next time.